Dhamma is public information. It doesn't belong to any particular nationality or religion. It belongs to the world. The Buddha enlightened for the benefit of worldly beings and angels. The Buddha emphasized humans and angels. There really are angels. These days when we speak about angels, we have to be a little careful we try to avoid speaking about them, but they do exist. One must be able to sense them on their own. I can't do this for you. There isn't a shadow of doubt in my mind about it. If we keep practicing, we will see that we create all kinds of realms in our own heart. When our heart is wholesome, it creates a wholesome realm when the heart is unwholesome it creates an unwholesome realm heaven will never be full and hell will never be full either the human world however is full it's because this world uses material resources the other realms are created only by the mind and heart so it doesn't matter how much is created they are never full for those who don't believe in other realms, it isn't my job to convince you. You certainly have the right to believe or not believe. The truth, though, is the truth. It doesn't matter what we believe. The truth has nothing to do with belief. Some people only believe in physics. That's better than just believing in ghosts and goblins. But physics isn't complete either. It can't discover or prove everything that exists. Like, the mind is an energy. Once there was a physicist who ordained here as a monk. He practiced with me here for a while. After a while, he explained that the mind is electromagnetic energy. Physicists separate the types of energy, and he classified the mind as electromagnetic energy. Lung Pu Dun once taught that it is the birth of matter and mind in the universe that causes the existence of realms and the infinite number of stars and planets in the universes. Matter and matter attract each other and form what begins the birth of the cycle of change in time. Matter is able to have motion because there is mind. Mind, which is the space existing between different forms. If there's no empty space, then matter cannot move. Lung Pu Dun was an elderly man, and he never went to school. He never studied this. He said from matter and mind of things that didn't have life developed into matter and mind of things that do have life but no consciousness. And matter and mind of things that have life but no consciousness from that gave birth to matter and mind of things that have life and consciousness. He talked about the theory of creation, the beginning of animal life for beings. He said there was no godly being that created material existence. It was from material things that beings, that life, was created. The animate can spawn from the inanimate. The first animals mostly just did unwholesome things. They ate each other primarily. They didn't know what to eat, so they ate each other, which didn't allow them to evolve higher. It was a revolving cycle of unwholesome states. Those of us that practice, we've seen the movement and revolving of states in the center of the chest area, right? Especially when there are really harsh states arising inside us. We can feel samsara, the cycle of birth and death, cycling around in the center of the chest. When the mind is more refined and in refined states, the cycling in the center of the chest is softer and gentler. But either way, samsara cycles inside us, fostering the movement and collection of good and bad mental states over and over again. The good states take us to be born in realms, and the bad states cause us to be born in other realms. All animals, all beings perform karma action with results. 
Lung Po Dun continued by teaching the way to practice the Dhamma all the way to liberation from the cycle of birth and death. He said the cause must be eliminated and the result is eliminated once karmic debts are repaid. There's no reason to be born ever again. The cause must be eliminated. What's the cause? There are six causes, greed, aversion, delusion, and non-greed, non-aversion, non-delusion. These are the six causes, both the good and the bad. At some point, these must be eliminated. If we perform good karma, but we're intoxicated by it and we fall in love with doing such things, then we'll still be born again into nice realms. If we perform bad karma, then we'll be born into a bad or evil realm. When we're free of performing any karma at all, on that day, we'll be free of birth. Only the mind that is free of making karma is the mind of an arahant, a fully enlightened being. That's the only one. All other beings are making karma. Arahans are still alive, do work and perform things, but it's not karma, it's giriya. Their actions aren't being performed from these six causes. There's not the intention stemming from these causes. There's no good or bad intention. That's when we are free from suffering. We have to eliminate the cause and speaking in a more general way, the cause of suffering is desire or craving. The Buddha taught that the cause of suffering must be eliminated. In the Four Noble Truths, it's called Samudaya, meaning the cause, which must be eliminated. The effect or result, Lung Pu Dun said, is that we have to pay our dues and accept our reality. For example, we're born with this appearance. This appearance is a result and there are causes for it. The karma we've done in the past created this appearance. As a human being, this physical body has an age limit and it has boundaries. Even the Buddha, who had such unbelievable karma, was born as a human being and therefore had a limit as to how long he could live. About a hundred years was the limit of a human being's lifespan at the Buddha's time with 200 years being the maximum limit if the human followed all the bases for success. In the Buddha's time, there was a monk that lived almost to be 200 years old. And now, many years later, have you noticed that there are still some masters here in Thailand who live to a very ripe old age? In early 2018, a master, Lung Pu Bun Ni, passed away. He was one of the first students of Lung Ta Mahabua. He was a great monk in his own right. And he and other famous monks from the same generation, for example, Lung Pu Li, both died at almost 100. A famous monk recently died at the age of 100 years old, 10 months, and 13 days. He died three days too late, or it would have been 10, 10, 10. I guess the doctors were three days too good. The most recent death of a great master here is Ajahn Bunyarit. He was 104 years old. He had a really great mind. If there wasn't karma interfering, he could have lived even longer. In some cases, there are great masters, great practitioners, but karma gets in the way and they die early. Some great practitioners, no matter how many lifetimes they live, never get an opportunity to ordain as a monk. The earliest age to become a monk is 20 years old. And there are some beings who keep dying in each life before the age of 20 and so they can never ordain. It's a karmic situation. In one particular case, there was a being born as a tiger and killed many animals. 
so his karma prevented him from reaching the age of 20 in every lifetime. Too much killing. The great master Li. He was a soldier or a warrior in a past life, and he died around 50 years old. It doesn't matter how much one attains in their practice, no one is superior to their karma. The Buddha died at 80 years old of intestinal bleeding. He attained nirvana, and yet still he had intestinal bleeding. Why does it have to be that way? It was karma. He was a doctor once and poisoned someone, so he had to endure the results of that. Karma is what arranges us to have a body like this and a mind like this. It's all the results of karma. If we practiced Dhamma in past lives, then the practice is much easier for us in this life. The cause and effect of karma is the most just and fair thing there is. Those of us here listening to Dhamma are a tiny minority. There are many billions of people in the world, and such a small number have the opportunity to listen to the Dhamma. In Thailand, there are so many people who have the opportunity to listen to the Dhamma, but then the actual number that do are such a small number. And then those who have the opportunity to listen to the Dhamma here in Thailand, and then actually listen, and then actually practice the teachings, is yet an even smaller number. The residual number of people is extremely minuscule. Even here in this room, not all of us listening are going to be diligent practitioners. Even among diligent practitioners, who are the ones practicing correctly, appropriately, and according to the Dhamma they're listening to as hard and as much as they can? Well, now we're talking about a tiny, tiny number. And that's why there are such a few number of people that enlighten and are able to attain nirvana. It isn't because there's someone who's able to control the number. We're controlling our own destiny here. We are the ones putting in the causes and reaping the results of our karma. So, if we are discouraged or lazy, if we don't practice with the proper vigor, then we circle around in samsara. There is nothing more just than that. When I see someone that does a lot of evil, I think, when this person dies, I'm not going to send blessings for them to move up into higher realms. Then when they do die, I feel compassion for them and do provide blessings, but it's not as easy to do so as for people that do good. When those with unwholesome hearts die, it's not easy to get them out of their evil or their unwholesomeness. We can't wait around for others to give us blessings when we die so that we move up in the realms. We have to put in the work ourselves. Let's create a good heart here and now. And if we want to gain wisdom and insight, we have to practice the Dhamma. If we want wisdom, that doesn't mean we have to give alms food to the monks. That's a completely different matter altogether. If we want to be wealthy, then we give and are generous with others. If we want to have a beautiful appearance, then let's keep a moral code. But if we want to know the truth, understand, cause and effect, and enlighten, then we need to practice vipassana and gain wisdom. Similar causes produce similar effects. So if someone puts food in my monk's bowl and makes a witch to makes a wish to achieve nirvana, that nirvana will take a very, very long time. It will take long because they're not so smart yet. We have to put in the correct causes to achieve the correct results. If we plant a mango seed, we'll get a mango tree. If we plant rice seeds, we'll get rice. We get whatever we put in. If we want to be free from suffering, then we have to diligently practice the Dhamma. If we want to be free from suffering, our morality has to be good, our samadhi has to be good, and our wisdom has to be right. If we want to continue in this cycle of birth and death, but move up into higher realms, then let's be moral and generous. Practice meditation. No need to practice wisdom, and we'll be born into a nice realm after we die. We'll get to be a human again, or an angel, or a Brahma deity, but we won't attain nirvana. If we want to attain nirvana, then we need vipassana. Or if we'd like to move into a lower realm, then believe it or not, there are some people that would like to do that. Have any of us met such people? I've met quite a few. Some people make charitable offerings and then wish to be, in their next life, the dog of a Westerner. That is a lower realm, a suffering realm. If we ask them why they'd like to be a Westerner's dog, 
they'd reply that they don't need to worry about how to get food, that they'd get fed all the time, that they'd get showered, they'd get sent to the spa for a haircut and get all prettied up, and that they'd get nice new accessories for those wishing to become a cat or a dog. There's no way I'll give any blessings towards that. It's possible to wish to be a cat or a dog and then be born as a cat or a dog. Did you know that? It is possible. It's not impossible. The easiest way to become a cat or a dog is to do evil in this lifetime. You may even be born as something worse than a dog or a cat. There are four main categories of realms. The animal realm, the asura realm, the hungry ghost realm, and the hell being realm. Does anybody know which is the worst of the four suffering realms? Raise your hand if you believe it's the hell being realm. For those of you who think it isn't, then what is it? The answer is the animal realm. Humans become animal beings out of the collection of delusion or the force of delusion. Beings become hell beings out of the collection of anger. The defilement we call delusion has the most punishment, the most demerit. Animals don't know the difference between good and bad, and they can't better themselves. Hell beings are in the harshest realm, so if they move out of it, they will only move up. For an animal, it's very hard to get out of the suffering realms, and it can get harsher. The exception to that are bodhisattvas who are born as animals. Yes, they do exist. Those animals have superior minds to us. They're born as animals because they have made mistakes in their previous life. Bodhisattvas can still make mistakes and even fall into hell. In any case, karma makes us cycle around in birth and death. Wanting to free ourselves of the cycle and birth of death is wanting to be free from suffering. We have to improve ourselves to do so. So let's upgrade our hearts to a higher class. The way to do this is refraining from sinful activity, cultivating wholesomeness and good. The things that are wholesome are non-greed, non-aversion, and non-delusion. Non-greed, not being greedy and not wanting other people's things, is the simplistic way to see it. Having an honorable and appropriate job or career is called right livelihood. This is a wholesome action that doesn't infringe upon others. Then non-anger or non-aversion is metta or loving-kindness. Let's get our hearts familiar with metta. About 30 years ago, back when there were lots of great masters, I was sitting with one of them. He said to me, I've had a look, and there are a lot of hell beings that are being born as humans these days. In the past, us Buddhists and Dhamma practitioners were in India. Those who were fortunate and had abundant merit were born in India. In result, suffering beings would arrive in India in droves because the auras and light emanating from the high-quality hearts there would attract suffering beings who were ready to be reborn. They came up to India, and the practitioners wouldn't tolerate this infusion, so they escaped to Thailand. Similarly now, the bright auras of all the practitioners have attracted many lower and suffering beings to be born in Thailand. Thus, Thailand is also going to be a place of much hostility and turmoil. It would be hard, it'll be hard for us practitioners to remain. The suffering beings can remain because they're comfortable being with each other. So let's all accelerate our practice here so that we can be free of all of this and escape this world full of turmoil and suffering. The world is going to be a hard place to be there will be a lot of harms to humans. That's what the master said. I can't confirm it's true, as I don't have the same psychic powers that he does. But if we take a look, it does look like an evil world these days, boiling over with problems more and more all the time. It's possible I see it this way because I'm getting older. Elderly people's perspective is often one where they don't have the strength anymore to fight. Their feeling is that this world is too violent to fight through. I'm getting older. When I go to some places, they let me in for free as a senior. Our nun here still has to pay, but maybe next year when she's 60, she won't have to anymore at the national parks. 
older people think, boy, this world is harsh these days, but actually they may just not have the strength they once had. In some cases, we may just not be familiar with this new world. We may have been born at a time when life consisted of farming, growing rice and vegetables. Making a life or a living wasn't complicated. Now what we have to do is make money. Now what we have to do to make money is astonishing. Soon we may have robots doing human's work. Then how will we make a living? Older people can't fathom how it will be done, but the younger generations will figure it out on their own. Maybe we'll be servants for the robots and take care of them. We aren't equipped for the new world, so according to Darwin, we should be extinct. We can't be born in this painful, uncertain world. We can't cohabit with these people. The type of livelihood we're familiar with has disappeared from this world. In the not-so-distant past, we could publish books and sell them. Plenty of money would circulate that way. But people don't read books anymore. The paper companies would grow eucalyptus trees for paper, and now they can't be sold. There were huge camera and film companies, but film is bankrupted now. There's no livelihood for these people. Some people have adapted to sell quality lenses for digital cameras and can keep struggling through it. In the future, the oil industry will be in jeopardy because we won't have to use oil for energy. Wealth is no longer certain in the future if you're one who holds oil. Everything changes. In the past, if you wanted to sell something, you had to open a store. Now you don't need to open a store. Now collecting taxes becomes a headache. How do we collect taxes? Now we're doing it through banking. We're finding new ways. Some people are able to adapt to the new ways and most cannot. They don't know what to do. Society changes so quickly and stress increases more and more. More suffering is on the horizon. If we have wisdom and mindfulness, then we can practice the Dhamma. If we keep at it, one day we won't have to wallow with the rest of them here. For now, we have to be among them. In the future, we'll find our liberation. We will have paid all of our debts and we won't have to be born again. What debts? Our karmic debts. We're always making karma. Let's make good karma, not any more bad karma. And most importantly, let's make our mind spotless. Let's use our morality, samadhi, and wisdom to polish and clean this mind and heart continuously. If we merely avoid evils, do good, but don't develop our mind sufficiently, we'll continue in the cycle of birth and death. So eliminating sin and unwholesomeness even the smallest varieties, doing good, if we have the opportunity is fine, but what is integral is washing this heart and mind completely clean. If we haven't been moral, let's be moral. If we haven't had correct samadhi, making the mind a stable observer, then let's practice, the, let's practice doing so. If we haven't practiced vipassana, then let's get started. Practicing vipassana isn't a difficult thing. Let's become aware of this body and mind of ours and not fall off track, becoming interested elsewhere. Let's learn to become aware of this body and mind in a natural and normal way, not stiff and stressed, not making a mind that is stiff and held and dulled and still. Even hell beings are familiar with these harsher states. Let's instead be a natural and normal human being and keep studying oneself using an ordinary mind. Let's be aware of ourselves with a human's mind, not an animal's mind or a hungry ghost's mind. A hungry ghost's mind is a greedy mind. If we're practicing and we really want to enlighten, then we're practicing with a hungry ghost's mind. We don't practice to accomplish or get anything. We practice to simply accomplish seeing the truth of this body and the truth of this mind. That's it. When we see the truth, then attachment is released on its own. It isn't us that eliminates this attachment. We can't do it. 
So let's study this body and mind of ours. Let's not let the mind wander off for too long. Be by, be by oneself and learn oneself. As much as possible, learn the body and mind. Don't force or control them. Just learn them. Learn them as they actually are. We'll see that this body is impermanent, suffering and not a self. This mind is something that is impermanent, suffering and not a self. So we learn and we see the truth. We see the three characteristics of impermanent suffering and non-self of this body and mind. Impermanence means that once was is no longer. It's gone. It's ended. That's impermanence. Suffering means whatever is here now is under oppression, under stress to dissolve and disappear. That which is now present is dissolving into no longer being. Non-self means that all things, whether arising, whether persisting, or whether falling away or gone, all exist out of causes and not out of command or being ordered into being. All things have causes. When the cause is present, it arises. When the cause is not there, it disappears. And this isn't controllable. If the mind accepts this truth, then there will no longer be struggle in the mind. It won't struggle out of evil. It won't struggle out of goodness. There will be no movement or wavering to either good or bad. Even struggle to enlighten will no longer be there anymore. The struggle to enlightenment is on the good side, and even that won't be there either. The mind that no longer moves toward anything, no longer struggles, is a mind that has no momentum to be born anywhere. The cause has ended, and thus the effect disappears. It's all paid back. The arahant has no more cause arising, Yet human life continues for them a little while longer. Some Arahans live up to a hundred years of age even. These are old causes from the past that have made the result of their body sustaining for a while. Once those previous causes have lost their momentum, there won't be the aggregates for that being anymore. The cessation of aggregates is the cessation of suffering. This isn't scary. Instead, it's the most blissful state. The end of the aggregates is the end of suffering. Keep practicing, and if we watch the mind, then let's have the wisdom that sees the mind like the eyes see sense objects. Wisdom seeing the mind doesn't mean only practicing mindfulness. It means seeing with wisdom, too. It means seeing the three characteristics. The way to see the three characteristics is seeing phenomena the way the eyes see objects. It's not about controlling them. It's just seeing them as they are. However the mind or the heart is, we just know that it is so. If the mind is greedy, we know so. If the mind is angry, we know so. If the mind is deluded, we know so. If the mind is lost, we know so. If the mind is scattered, we know so. If the mind is depressed, we know so. If the mind is happy or unhappy, we know so. Just know the mind as it is repeatedly. That's wisdom seeing phenomena the way the eyes see sense objects. We'll see all phenomena, whether good or bad, happy or sad, are all subject to the three characteristics. If that's how we're watching the mind, then we will know how to watch the mind. Making the mind still or empty, that's just fabricating realms. It's forming wholesome states, making the mind clear and empty. That's not the right way. Some people say that Lung Pu Dun taught us to make the mind empty, make it not think or formulate or fabricate anything, but that's not what he taught. That's Samatha, making the mind empty. Lung Pu Dun taught me to have wisdom to see the mind like the eyes see sight objects. That's Vipassana. So let's be careful. Some people say that they learn from Lung Pu Dun have only learned some parts and don't understand the teachings in their completeness. People only teach what they know, so some people only teach to repeat budo, budo, and some people teach to make the mind empty. Making the mind empty is just creating or fabricating a good or wholesome state. This isn't useful for liberation. It's born out of ignorance. We have to destroy ignorance. Ignorance is not knowing the Four Noble Truths, not knowing suffering, its cause, its cessation, its path leading to the end of suffering. It's not knowing our duty with respect to suffering 
our duty with respect to its cause, our duty with respect to its cessation, and our duty with respect to the path leading to the end of suffering. Ignorance at its essence is not knowing these eight things with respect to the noble truths. Not knowing suffering means not knowing that this body and mind are suffering proper. We haven't seen this yet. We still think that this body is happy sometimes and suffering at other times. We still think that this mind or heart is happy sometimes and suffering at other times. We still haven't seen that this body and mind are suffering. We think that they are happy sometimes or su and suffering sometimes. We have to practice vipassana to see the truth that they are suffering. There is only suffering. Only suffering considerably and suffering less so. Other than suffering, nothing arises, nothing persists, and nothing falls away.